Father, we humble ourselves before you and we stand in desperate need of your love and mercy and compassion. We worship you for waking us up and giving us the activities of our limbs. We thank you and bless you for giving us a mind to be in the house of worship. We pray and thank you not only for being able to be here, but we thank you for our, even our online campus all over the world. We are grateful for those who have connected with us. We pray that you take hear our hearts today as we pray for the unsaved, the backslidden, the unsure, the unchurched, the uncommitted. Draw them to your kingdom, almighty God. Open their eyes that they might recognize to need to be a part of your family. And Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you put a shield around this place and a shield around every home and every place where this message is being received. Allow our hearts to be opened. God, open our eyes to see the revelation the rhema word of this message and allow it to apply to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. All right. You can be seated. Open your Bibles to the book of James chapter four. James chapter four. James chapter four. And last week I talked about the seven signals, evidences, indicators that you might be in a backslidden condition. By the way, I think I said, if I didn't, I'm going to say it again today, you don't need all seven to be backslidden. All it takes is an inclination to be in one and you can be in that posture. So I gave all seven last Sunday. Today I want to talk about seven acts that reveal that you have repented. Oh my. Oh my. Yeah, let me talk about, because some, some, what some people call repentance is not truly repentance. Can I talk about repentance for a moment? I'm going to talk about it whether y'all give me permission or not. I want to talk about the fact that repentance is not a 360 degree turn. So, so if you make a 360 degree turn, hey, I'm gonna make a 360 degree to turn. I'm gonna turn around and 360 is, I'm right back where I started. That's 360. Repentance is a 180 degree turn. <clears throat> it's that you make a turn and you go in the opposite direction of where you were headed. <clears throat> Thank all five of y'all for that amen to that verse. Revelatory point. That's what repentance is. It is the definition of repentance. The, the, the desire for God is for us to make a 180 degree turn. It's, repentance is not being sorry you got caught. It is godly sorrow for what you have done to the point of change. There was a song that uh, came out or a phrase that became a song some years ago that says, until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, you won't change. That went over y'all's head. Let me back it up and give it to you. Until the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change, you won't change. In other words, as long as the pain of what you're doing isn't as bad, until it gets worse, then you change it. You, you keep walking in the same path. So the call of God to our lives is to live a life of repentance. As a matter of fact, jot this down, I'm not gonna turn to it, but in Hebrews chapter six, read Hebrews chapter six, those first few verses of Hebrews chapter six gives us the foundational truths of, of what believers should learn. Matter of fact, we want people to learn those six foundational truths in Hebrews chapter six. And the first two are f a life of faith and a life of repentance. Now that's important, I want you to write those down. We are people of faith. Somebody say, we are people of faith. We believe God, that's, that's why we, we, we live the way we live, we walk the way we walk, we serve the way we serve, because we are people of faith, we believe God. We know that God is a miracle worker, we have faith. But the second point in the Hebrew six, the second element of foundational truths is the 
Repentance. Repentance is a lifestyle. Write that down. It's a lifestyle. It's not a one-time act. It's a lifestyle. I've discovered that the closer I get to God, he is constantly pointing out the raggediness of my life. He's constantly pointing out to me the things I need to change, what, what I need to posture, because, because we often, all too often, uh, equate repentance just with things that you do physically. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I want you to understand that repentance also includes the condition of your heart. You can be doing all the right things physically, but your heart can be so strayed and so backed up. It also includes the way you think. Because some of y'all got some stinking thinking. Look at the person next to you and see if you can tell they got some stinking thinking. Hebrews, Hebrews 6 calls these elements in Hebrews 6 elementary principles. This is the beginning, and it's important for us to understand that the Lord has called us to live a life of repentance. We never arrive. You never get to the place where you, 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 you don't need to change. Look at your neighbor and say, you need to change, bro. You need to change, girlfriend. With your jacked up self. Go ahead, tell him you jacked up. You nasty. You rude. You're selfish. You're, you're independent. You're proud. Go ahead and preach, Pastor. I'm doing the best that I can. And you need to have a lifestyle of repentance. If you sow a thought, you will reap an act. If you sow an act, you will reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you will reap a lifestyle. And if you sow a lifestyle, you will reap a destiny. Ooh, that's y'all, did y'all get that? I need y'all to get that. So it's a lifestyle. God's called us to live a lifestyle of repentance. And in James chapter four, I think I told y'all to turn there already, mentioned seven areas that we're called to repent in. And I want to try to get through in these next few moments all seven areas of what he mentions to us. James chapter four, and I, can I start at verse seven? Thank you very much. He says, you one lone person gave me permission. I'm gonna to go to verse, let me start at verse seven. It says, therefore, submit to God. Stick a pen, there's the first one right there. Submission to God. Submit, submitting means to place yourself under, to obey, to yield. We're all called to submit to someone or somebody, but for sure you're called to submit to God. Now, if can't nobody tell you to sit yourself down? Can't nobody tell you you talk too much? If nobody can, can give you instructions that you will obey, you are out of control. You are not submitted, can't nobody tell. I, I know there's an attitude, particularly among men, that he, he put his, leg, his pants on one leg at a time, just like me, I ain't, ain't gonna handle no man telling me what to do. You are out of control, bro. Everybody, the amens are getting quieter and quieter and quieter. Who, who has the right or the authority in your life to tell you what to do? I asked the question, I didn't get no answers. Who has the right or the authority to submit, that you will submit to? Who, 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 where are you submitted in your life? We're all called to be submitted to somebody. And, and right here the text says, therefore submit to God. And God does his work through human beings on the planet. Now, uh, my friend Bunny Wilson uses an illustration that I wanna steal. And I give her credit at eight, at 10 and 12, I will say the Lord showed it to me. <laughs> Bunny Wilson used an illustration about submission. And she said, if, if you're driving your Volkswagen on a two lane highway that's narrowing into one lane, 
and you're in the right of way. You're in the right lane, and in the left lane, the, cl the lane that's closing is an 18-wheeler truck that's coming over into the right lane where you are, and you have the right of way. The question is, are you going to yield? And you can stay and declare that you got the right of way and you ain't yielding, and you will be right, but you will be dead right. It is in your best interest to yield to the 18-wheeler. And in life, it's better for you to yield to the will of God by yielding to somebody else. Now, this is a, I, can, I can talk the rest of the day about this first point, that God is calling us to have a lifestyle of being yielded and, and, and submitting to him. And we submit to God and we yield to him by submitting to the people he tells us to yield to. So the scriptures are clear. God gives us multiple areas in which we are to yield. I don't have time to go into the specifics, but my, I simply raised the question that repentance is reflected by your willingness to be yielded to some authorities in your life. Amen. Let me roll on. I wish I could tell though. Here's that. That's the first act of repentance is submitting to God. Here's the second one right here in verse 7-2. It says, resist the devil. Somebody say, resist the devil. Write that down. That's number two. Resist the devil. The word resist means to oppose, withstand, to stand against. And y'all do know the devil must be resisted. He, he's not going to simply go away with you doing a whimper or, or whatever. You got you to gotta resist him. You got to oppose him. You got to withstand him. You got you to stand against him. As a matter of fact, uh, verse number seven says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The, the, the reason the devil keeps messing with you and keep coming in your life is you have not yet resisted. Because the scripture says if you resist the devil, the devil will flee from you. If he, I'm right here in the text right here, verse seven. If you resist the devil, he'll leave you alone. Now he might come back, but at least he's gonna leave you alone for a little while. If he keeps hanging around, if he keeps talking, if he keeps trying to influence you, if he keeps trying to persuade you, he in fact is, has not been resisted. Jesus demonstrates to us in Luke chapter 4 how he resisted the devil. In Luke 4, the devil kept tempting Jesus and kept coming at him. And then the scripture says on three occasions, the devil came at Jesus time after time after time. And Jesus resisted every time by quoting scripture to him. He resisted him. And the scripture says after he resisted him, the devil departed from him for a season. Read Luke 4 write it down. I don't have time to turn there. But if you resist the devil, he will leave you alone for a season. And that's what we want. We want him to leave us alone. The devil, Jesus models for us that if we resist the devil, he will flee from us. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, if you stop messing with the devil, if you stop talking to the devil, if you stop entertaining the devil, if you stop engaging with him and liking his stuff and being around his and listening to his conversation, if you stop looking at his programs that he had put on television, if you stop reading the magazines that he puts out and looking at the pictures that he puts out and listening to the music that he's writing, you might be able to resist him. But no, you like it. Y'all ain't hearing me. You like his stuff. And you wondering why he won't leave you alone because you have made room for the devil. You have made an avenue for him. Look at your neighbor and say, you know, pornography is making room for the devil. Go ahead. I said, tell the person sitting next to you, pornography is making room for the devil.
Why am I feeling tension in the room? Some of the music that you're listening to is promoting the very opposite of God's principles and you know the words from beginning to end. And you even get up and worship to that music. And you dance. You ain't, you ain't never danced for Jesus, but you... I feel tension in the room. Resist the devil. I love this verse right here because he gives us, if you oppose the devil, if you withstand him, if you stand against him, he will flee from you. You keep talking about you don't want the devil, you tired of why the devil keep messing with you? Because you keep inviting him. You like him. Here's number three. I'm right here, I'm in the text right here, verse number eight. Here's my next one, number three. Draw near to God. I love this verse. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Repentance means I make a decision to stop living my life the way I want to live it, but now I'm making choices and decisions to draw near to God. You know what's powerful about this verse? God says, if you make a step, here's what this means. If you make a step toward God, he will make a step towards you. As a matter of fact, you make one step toward God, he'll make 10 steps towards you. Draw near to him. What, what are the choices that you are making in your life that are indicators that you are making an attempt to get closer to God? I'm asking the question, I didn't get no answer. What steps are you making in your life? What actions are you taking in your life? What decisions, what commitments are you making that you want to draw closer to God? What books are you reading? What music are you listening to? This is going right back. What, who are you praying to? Who are you talking to? Who, what, what messages are you meditating on? What are you memorizing? What's in the core of your being that you are drawing near to God? I love the fact that God says, if you know, let me, let me put it in this, let me, let me verbalize it this way. If you're not as close to God as you used to be, make no mistake about who has gone astray. And if you're not as close to God as you desire to be, it is not because God has not postured himself to be close to you. You know, the Lord loves you. He wants a tight, close relationship with you. He desires to walk with you. You, you know, when you, when you have a walk with God, when you are in, in harmony with God, when you're walking in God's will, you see the hand of God. You see him opening doors. You see, you know what I discovered? I see God answering prayers even before I ask him for what I want him to do for me. I see him working miracles in my life. I, I see him fighting battles for me and winning on my behalf. I, I see him doing things for me that are beyond my wildest dreams. And the same thing he's doing for me, I, I'm not special. Well, maybe I'm a little bit special. I'm, I'm not so special that God will do more for me than he does for you. Look at what has God has done for me. He has done miracles for me. He will do the same for you if you make the same right choice. Here's number four. Thank all 17 of y'all for that rousing affirmation. It's right here. I'm still in verse eight right here. I'm just walking down through the text. These are signs of in Acts of Repentance, it says in verse number eight, not only draw near to God and he will draw near to you, but then it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Somebody say, clean your hands up. T tell your neighbor, your hands is dirty. You gotta, you gotta cleanse your hands. What are you touching? My friend, Pastor Maurice Watson, was hospitalized several years ago and almost lost his life. And the doctors concluded he had con contracted a virus that they're not sure exactly how he got it. But they concluded that perhaps 
he had the virus and it took months for it to conquer and overcome his body, but they concluded that it was a strong chance that he got it because he shook somebody's hand that had the virus. And he connected with that person and they shook hands, held hands or whatever they did and it caused this virus to attack his body. And I want to ask you the question, what are you touching that might be dirtying up your hands? The people, the things, the practices, the habits that's hindering you from getting close to God but you got your hand... Your hands is touching something you ain't got no business touching. I can tell some of y'all got a problem with this by the way you're looking at me. But by the way, you can look at me as hard as you want. I ain't going to stop. I'm still going down this road. What are your hands touching? What, what are you connected to? What are your hands involved with? But hold up. I wish I could stop right there. Uh, it says right here in verse number eight, it says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. We've all sinned. We all are sinners. We're all in that category. We've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God is saying, what do you have your hands attached to? What are you dragging with you? What do you have your hands in? But hold up, hold up. Before I, before I sit down, I got to also read this. The last part of verse eight, it says, purify your hearts. You dumb old mind. Did somebody say purify your heart? <laughs> See, the reason your hands are touching some stuff you ain't got your, yourself right is because your heart has made it okay. Ooh. I knew y'all wasn't going to like this kind of preaching. I didn't expect anybody to run around and shout and, oh, it's a little bit of money up here. I, I didn't think people would jump up here and drop some money but here what does that mean your heart it means your thoughts and your feelings when the Bible talks about your heart that's what it means what you think and what you feel to many of us need we, we need to understand that out of the abundance of your heart your mouth speaks your heart your heart your feelings your thoughts these things these conditions this posture of of your thought. As a matter of fact, some of you let your emotions control your life. You let your feelings control your life. And that's a dangerous thing to let your feelings control your life. The scripture is clear. Choose this day who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve and obey God? Or are you going to allow your emotions to call the shots? Your emotions can't be trusted. Your heart cannot be trusted. Your heart, you know what the Bible says? Your heart is desperately wicked. You can't know your heart. You can't go by your heart. You can't trust your opinions. I like what the prophet said to the people one time. How long will you be halted between two opinions? If God be God, serve him. If, if Baal be God, then serve him. Who is it that you're going to serve? Stop letting your emotions and your, appealing, your, your opinions govern your, your life. Purify your hearts. And that word purify means to sanctify it. That's what it means, sanctify, to set it aside. Sanctify means to clean it up. And that's, that's something God gives us the power with his presence to do in our lives to sanctify your heart. Your heart will stray. Your heart will run off the beaten path and go down the wrong road. But if you listen to the voice of the Lord, he will clean you up. He'll make your heart pure. He'll make your thoughts and your emotions pure. Let me go to number six. I got to hold it. I got to hurry up. I got, I got a, lot of room, a lot of room to cover, but not enough time to do it. And then he says this in verse nine. Are y'all still with me, verse nine? He spends one whole verse on this next point. He says, lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. I call it embracing godly sorrow. It, that's what I call it, embracing godly sorrow, being at a posture or a place of being godly sorrow. Matter of fact, the scriptures are clear, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, jot it down, don't have time to turn there, but jot down 2 Corinthians 7, 10, says godly sorrow produces repentance. 
when you are sorry, deeply sorry that you have offended God, when you are deeply sorry that you recognize that you've gone against the will and the word of God. And matter of fact, you not only went against God, you liked it. What you was doing, I know that ain't a word, but I made it up as I went along. You enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, some of you like your sin so much that you've dedicated space in your house to it. You've built a bar so you could house the stuff that you enjoy. You subscribe to the cable channels that bring the filth into your... You ain't godly sorrow. Sorry. Yeah, uh, my kids get upset with me because I don't have HBO. They say, Dad, Daddy, why don't you have HBO? Because I don't want that filth in my house. I don't, listen, hold up. I don't want to even introduce the spirit of that into my house. I feel the amens getting lower and lower. I can tell when, bam, I hit y'all right there. I'm just trying to help y'all understand godly sorrow means I'm sad that I've made way. Some of y'all's cable bill is more than what you paid in church three times a month. And all I'm trying to tell you to do is repent. Turn around. Get off that road. God, be godly sorrow. Feel the same pain that God feels about your choices. You can justify it all you want. You can make it okay all you want. But God is watching your choices and your decisions and he sees what you're doing. I need to ask you what area of your life is God calling you to repent in that you haven't stopped, that you haven't changed? What is he requesting? What is he asking you to do? I don't know why I feel so much resistance in the house. I, I, y'all might as well get on board. I'm going to keep on preaching the same thing. I'm almost finished. I'm trying. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm just trying to speak to somebody that God is calling you to a day and a time of repentance. I'm just trying to get you to a place of making change. Here's my, here's my seventh and last area of repentance. Oh, I heard somebody over here say, okay, thank the Lord, you're finally done. I think it was over here somewhere. I think it was that Cowboys fan over here. I won't. Here's number 10. Here's on verse 10, number seven, verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Here's number, here's number seven is repentance is humility. That's, that's what it is. Humble yourself. Bring yourself to a place of humility. Be humble in the sight of God. Bring yourself to a low position before the Lord. This is a very important instruction because over and over and repeatedly, over and over again, God loves humility. God loves humility. God loves humility. As a matter of fact, on multiple occasions, the scripture says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. As a matter of fact, in James, he says he gives more grace. That's what I love about God. He gives more grace. He will fill you up with grace. That's what it says in verse 6, as a matter of fact, in chapter 4. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I like the NIV. It says God opposes the plans of the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I, I just need to tell you, you're not all that. You're not all that you think you are. God is calling you to walk humbly before him. Recognize humility simply means that I recognize that without God, I am absolutely nothing. Without his help in my life, I am a jacked up joker. Without him calling the shots in my life, I am wretched and undone. And you know what I like about this verse? He says, humble yourself. I love this verse right here. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And then it says this, he will lift you up. Oh, I got to shout for just a second because I got to bring you some good news as to why you ought to do all of this because when you repent before God, he will lift you up. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody here needs to be lifted up. 
The word lift up means to be elevated. Lift it up to be, means to be exalted. It means God will make you great. I, I love that because when God makes you great, can't nobody make you less than that. When God elevates you, can't nobody drag you down. When God elevates you, he opens up doors and windows in your life that no man can close. Hold up. You know what lift means? When you look up the, the lift word in the original Greek word, it means God will do it presently and in your future. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Somebody say, he'll do it right now and in your future. Somebody say, he got my back covered. He got my future covered. God will lift me up. If I walk a life of repentance, if I live a lifestyle of repentance, if I humble myself before God, he will lift me up. Who am I preaching to today? Somebody give God a shout and say, he'll lift you up. Tell your neighbor, he'll lift you up. I'm looking for God to lift me up right now, today and tomorrow. Today and tomorrow. Now I'm done, I'm finished. I, 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 I'm done. I want to challenge you today to live a lifestyle. Somebody say lifestyle. Say it a little bit louder. Say lifestyle of repentance. It's every day. Every day. God is challenging me every day to walk closer to him. And I, I don't know. I want you to pause and think about what areas in your life is God calling you to repent of. I asked the question. I asked you in your mind, what is God telling me? I just gave you seven ways we can repent before the Lord. Let me ask everybody to stand for just a moment. I'm finished. I'm done. I'm going to do an invitation. I'm going to lead you right here to a place of finding out if there's somebody here today who needs to repent because they've never accepted Jesus in their life. You know what the great news about following Jesus is? When you accept Jesus, when you embrace his death, burial, and resurrection, he promises to save you and forgive you of all of your sins. And you, you never have to fear after you make that choice, hell. You never have to worry about going to hell because he promises to save you from hell. And if you're here today and you have not accepted the Lord Jesus, right now would be the perfect time for you to come and say, you know what? I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. If you've never accepted Jesus right now, right this moment would be the time for you to come. Or, or maybe, maybe perhaps you have backslid. I talked about this last week, but I'm talking about it again today. And today you need to repent. And you need to say, you know what, I need to re rededicate myself to the Lord right now, right this moment would be the time to come. Or maybe you're not sure. And you know you're saying, Pastor Jenkins, I want to get assurance. We can help you get sure today that you can have knowledge beyond a shadow of a doubt that you belong to God. Or number four, you are here. And you are, God bless you, buddy. I'm proud of you. Or maybe you're here and you're saved, but you don't have a church home, or you want to join our church, God is calling you to be a part of this church family. Right now, this moment would be the time to come. I like that song. Yes. 
but not for this song, not, for, not right now, because some people need to go back to where they used to be in God. So let's sing another song, not, not that one today. That's not, that's not going to work on this message right here today. Yeah, sing something. Come. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> good song. That's a good choice right there. Do it now. Do it right now. Yeah, there you go. Come right now. Right now. Don't put it off. Don't delay it. Unsaved, backslidden, you're not sure, you need a church. Help me celebrate these who are here today, including my cousin who came up here today. My cousin is up here, I'm so proud of her. I'm proud of you, I love you. Look at the person that you said. Are you supposed to be up there? Ask him. I feel like there's somebody else supposed to be. So you know what? I'll take you up there. I'll walk. You don't have to walk by yourself. I'll go with you. Don't put it off. Don't delay it. Just say, you know what? Let's get straight. Let's get it straight right now. Let's get right with God today. While the blood is running warm in your veins, let's come on and get. There you go. Come on. Yeah, don't put it off. How you doing? Y'all married? Y'all not married? Right now, right now. All right, Father. Father, I thank you for these who've come today. I pray that you minister to where they stand in the need of. Forgive them, cleanse them, wash them. Plant them in your vineyard, almighty God. Let them be in your perfect will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Excellent. Wonderful.